My name is Michael Byers. I'm from the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Um, I, I want to start by, by saying that I haven't been to an American Society of International Law meeting for over a decade um, for uh, family reasons, and those reasons have resolved themselves in a positive way, and it's great to be back. Um, I have the great honor of moderating this panel on international law as a counterweight to power asymmetries in international politics. And I, I think we've got a perfect uh, panel to, to dig into these issues, um, not so much from an academic perspective, but from the perspective of practitioners, um, providing us with some uh, real world examples that, that academics like me can then take and, and use for the purposes of, of our analysis. Um, again, it's, it's an exceptional panel. Um, beside me, I have uh, Victoria Hallam, uh, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of, of New Zealand. Um, next to her, I have uh, Danielle uh, Yaoping Ling from the uh, Attorney General's uh, Chambers in Singapore. Uh, and then we have uh, Jan Paulson, uh, who almost needs no introduction as one of the, if not the leading uh, practitioner in the field of, of international uh, litigation and, and arbitration. Um, and beside him, uh, Brian Egan, um, currently at Steptoe and Johnson, uh, but uh, prior to that, uh, the legal advisor uh, at the U.S. State Department. Um, I, I am a ruthless moderator and have banned speeches from this panel. Um, the way this is going to work is I'm going to ask our panelists a, a few questions uh, to uh, uh, get us going, um, but then the discussion will actually um, involve the, the whole room. Uh, so after roughly 35 or 40 minutes, uh, the uh, microphone uh, that is uh, on the floor there will go live. Um, when you ask your questions, please uh, do so in the spirit of a, a lively discussion. Um, you're allowed to uh, express uh, points, um, not only questions, but keep your intervention brief and, and try to keep it with the flow of the conversation. So if you wish to make a point that, that is not on the point that's currently under discussion, perhaps you know, give that place in line to the person behind you and, and slot in behind him or her so we can get some fluidity going here. Uh, I, I'm pretty confident it will work, um, but it will take all of us to, to make it do so. Okay, um, I'm going to start with, with Victoria from uh, New Zealand um, because she comes from a relatively small country. Um, Victoria, does, does international law function as a counterbalance to power or, or is this just a naive view on the part of uh, academics like me? Thanks very much, Michael, um, and good morning, everyone. My reflection on this, um, based on over 20 years practice, is that setting up international law in opposition to power is just too simplistic. Um, I think, uh, as Oster, Oscar Schachter has identified, power is actually incorporated within international law, and international law is a means of marshalling and channelling that power. Uh, whether that be through customary international law or treaty regimes. Um, and that's not surprising when we remember that we are fundamentally dealing with a consent-based system. Um, I can visualise the international legal system as a, a kind of bank that requires regular, sustained deposits of power to continue to function. Um, now, unfortunately, we've been observing some pretty significant withdrawals from that bank at the moment. Uh, so the Bank of International Law is looking a bit shaky, um, but I, I think there's still a lot we can do about that. Now, I don't think what I'm saying, though, is that international law is simply an instrument of the powerful. Um, and there's two reasons why I think it's not. Um, firstly, international law can be a pretty blunt and ineffective tool to deal with many circumstances. 
I think there are pretty massive gaps where power does not suffice and does not create solutions. And in these areas, the powerful and the powerless alike have a shared interest in creating a stable and predictable rules-based approach to problems. Um, I think Daniel Bethlehem identified these areas really well in a lecture he gave called The End to Geography. And he set out six interconnected areas where you need something more than power to resolve issues. And those areas, and I'll paraphrase, uh, shared spaces and global commons, uh, issues to do with the movement of people, both voluntary and not, challenges to human, animal, plant life and health, trade and financial flows, and the interconnectedness and systemic challenges that come with that, the challenges of cyberspace, and cross-boundary challenges to security particularly from non-state actors. And I have to say that New Zealand has had a rough awakening in the last couple of weeks with respect to these two challenges. And I'd just like to comment how devastated we are in New Zealand at the um, horrendous attack that took place in Christchurch two weeks ago against our Muslim community. Um, now, the second reason why I don't think my message is depressing and I'm still optimistic is I think that the sum of the parts of the international system is greater than the individual bits. I think there's a degree of layeredness and interconnectedness amongst the different treaty regimes, especially when they are backed up by institutions and dispute settlement systems that kind of operates a bit like a kind of plywood. So it has more strength and resilience than you might at first think. So again, although we are observing some challenges, I think the system has a kind of muscle memory and will endure for a while at least. Um, so those are my two kind of um, messages. Uh, so it doesn't work that well um, as a counterbalance to power, but it's a useful way of channeling and focusing power in a way to solve um, transboundary problems. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, Danielle. And, and I'm sure that I can speak for the room in, in sending our, our condolences to, to your country uh, over that, that tragic uh, event. Um, the uh, the leadership and moral strength of your prime minister has been particularly uh, striking, uh, impressive uh, to the world. Um, I want to move on to Danielle uh, now and uh, ask um, a question that that falls on from from Victoria's points, uh, and that is, um, how can less powerful states like like Singapore make that that plywood even more resilient? Um, uh, how can small states um, use international law uh, to to equalize or, or at least reduce the, oh. the power imbalances that exist in the international system? Uh, thank you, Michael, for that question. And thank you, Victoria, for the very pertinent uh, comments, which I think uh, resonate a lot with me as well. Um, I'd like to start off with this point. I mean, it's, if it's a small state and we like to hold on to the dogma and you know and hopefully others hold on to the same dogma that all states are equal regardless of their size and geopolitical power and that the rule of law applies and, and that's critical from from a small state perspective especially for singapore but i having said that i do remain conscious that at, at, a, at, a, at a certain level one always wonders this is a kernel of doubt whether all states necessarily or all actors within the state necessarily feel that way and from that perspective, what can us as a small states so collectively, not both, both small, medium, big size states, do to uh, ensure that the system remains robust and with a certain level of discipline within it as well? So I would say the overriding approach for us uh, would be um, this, this, this title of this book that was put up by uh, our former uh, foreign minister, uh, Professor Jayakuma, Be at the table or be on the menu. And, and that's, <laughs> it, it's, but that's the reality. Uh, are we price takers or do we set the rules or, or do we join the international community in setting the rules? And, and that's a very important question. That leads me to the next point. Well, how can we be on the table? Um, is it realistic for small states to do so? And I like to think that, yes, indeed, we are. International law, unlike, no, no different from domestic law, embodies values and policy choices that are continually being contested 
and negotiated. So one would approach this in the same way as one would approach any uh, discussion or debate in a domestic agenda. There are different views. How do we work around those? How do we gather others to come to your point of view? How do we listen? I would say firstly, there are a couple of steps. Firstly, active involvement in shaping new and emerging norms. And I very much uh, like what Victoria said, she mentioned six, of, six areas, cybersecurity being one, cross-border challenges to security and trade. And these are very important areas as well. But how can we look ahead of the curve? How do we participate in, in new norms? For example, um, you know, Singapore was very much involved in the development of the Singapore Mediation Convention under the auspices of Ancitron. And this is one area that we think we can all contribute to. Um, another area which is quite important um, is the area of digital economy. Uh, we were one of the 78 WTO members that agreed to start negotiations in a new framework for e-commerce. Uh, it was just announced at Davos in January. So to be effective in, in looking ahead to new norms, I think there are certain things we need to do. We need to be able to scan uh, for new ch uh, challenges and new norms to think ahead of the curve. Uh, we have to engage with industry and, and private sector because they are the players as well. Um, not in the traditional sense of players in the state-to-state -state relations or the setting of international law, but a lot of work that the government does can't be done in vacuo, especially in an area like cyberspace where the private actors, the tools and the mechanisms, the systems are actually in the realm of the private sector as well. So we have to think ahead of the curve, be responsive to new needs. We have to build up credibility and relevance uh, to be a trusted bridge builder, even on issues that perhaps be not necessarily core to your national interests, but nonetheless are important in maintaining uh, the, the, the importance, it's in channeling the importance that Singapore or small states uh, feel the international community is, is important and be part of. So where we can, we want to play a trusted mediator role to be a bridge builder, um, uh, to come up and, and put different perspectives together if we can. And we also recognize that a variety of mechanisms are needed. Uh, one does not just look at norms uh, in the sense of binding norms. I think there's a lot of potential, uh, in particularly new areas, more controversial areas, where there may be more comfort in looking at things like soft law or guidances or cooperative mechanisms. And that's particularly important. But in existing law, uh, in existing rules, we can also play, come, come and play a role in an interpretation and application of existing global rules by contributing to the state practice. For example, we are third parties in over 50 WTO cases, and, and that's an important uh, position, an important role. We may not necessarily want to be the contentious parties and disputing parties in the dispute, but we feel that there is a need, especially when they involve systemic issues, to come in. For example, we've made interventions on the plain, plain packaging case, uh, and we recently made interventions, and I was up in Geneva earlier uh, last year, um, to, talk, to, to share Singapore's perspective of the interpretation of the security exception. How does that work, and how would that apply? And that's another area where it is important. Um, and naturally, coming back to the title of this talk, utilizing and being utilizing and respecting uh, international uh, uh, dispute settlement bodies, utilizing them as we have done, um, with our neighbors in territorial disputes. And this is a particular area where, um, where small states can actually uh, sort of solve territorial and sovereignty issues in a very peaceful, uh, calm manner, uh, rather than it you know, conflating into a more inflammatory perspective. Um, one other point I want to talk about is actually um, what, I, what, what, um, what I call multi-power hubs. Uh, I simplify it because I think the world is not multipolar as such. I think we need to be very flexible in looking at where we can work with interested parties and like-minded parties on specific issues. So you may not be, you know, the world power in everything, but I think in certain areas where you feel that you can contribute and you can lead the charge with others, you can form and start creating little centers. And that's, that's what we have found quite effective uh, in the bilateral arena. Uh, in the regional arena within ASEAN, uh, and then in the multilateral level, and of course the plurilateral level now as well. So these are you know, very creative, uh, pragmatic ways that we can do so. But if I may just end off, Michael, if you're if you indulgent. Ultimately, you know, we have to look at um, international relations and international law as being part of a system, ecosystem, 
soft power is absolutely something that's important. The lawyers can only do so much. I, I like to tell my clients, ministry colleagues, the lawyers are, you know, are a tool. Uh, ultimately, where's the soft power? Where's the diplomacy? Where's the network you cultivate? Where are your friends? Um, and what are you engaging with other stakeholders? Um, you know, be it even at the NGOs or the civil society in your counterpart countries, where they can also play a role in forging alliances or in perhaps advocating views that you have, which may be shared by you know, a slightly more non-homogenous society or even the political establishment in other countries. I think those are little ways that we try. Wow, thank you. Um, I'm going to skip over Jan for just a minute or two and go to, to Brian. Um, Brian, you just heard from, from two of your colleagues from small states, albeit states with exceptionally competent foreign ministries, as, <laughs> as we've just seen. Um, the question for you is, um, does international law actually constrain the exercise of power by militarily, economically, politically um, stronger states, uh, at least in, in, in situations where, where powerful states really want a certain outcome? Um, or, or is it simply that international law provides a reason for, for, for all of us to, to think that, that it matters because sometimes big states uh, just don't care so much and, and, and therefore allow other outcomes to arise? Uh, thanks. Good morning, everyone. I, I I think the answer is clearly yes, that international law does constrain uh, big states. And it's for a couple of the reasons that Victoria and Danielle mentioned. Uh, one is that international law is a consent-based system. And I think big states play in this space because uh, they see advantages to doing so, but they understand the trade-off, which is that you are constraining yourself in uh, signing on to something. Uh, and so I think you can see that in, in any number of ways The current administration's objections in a number of spaces uh, to the actions of international organizations, I think show that they believe these rules matter and uh, that they, uh, rather than uh, not complying with rules, they are pulling out in some cases. And you can debate whether or not you think that's a good idea, but I think it shows that uh, they believe the rules do matter if, uh, if we are going to sign on. Uh, just thinking of my own experience, uh, one example where international law, two examples where international law did matter and I would say constrained the activities of large states. One would be the, uh, the Iran nuclear agreement, uh, the JCPOA, uh, which of course the United States is no longer part of, and that was an example of soft law, as Danielle said, not a uh, legally binding instrument, but one where uh, the U.S. gave up something that was pretty important to a lot of folks in the U.S. government, uh, which was the right to impose sanctions against other countries for doing business in, uh, with Iran in exchange for something that the U.S. government believed was pretty important, which was uh, assurances related to Iran's military nuclear program. Um, so that was something where the U.S. clearly put something on the table. It was controversial even within the government. It was constraining, and uh, the U.S., when they decided that was not the right equation, has, has pulled out of the deal. I disagree with the decision to pull out, but I respect the transparency behind that. Uh, another is that the Syria uh, uh, atrocities and uh, armed conflict, the decision by the Obama administration not to intervene militarily in response to the uh, horrific chemical weapons attacks in 2013. Uh, very heavily criticized by many, including in the United States, as the wrong decision, um, influenced in part by international law and the, the constraints on the use of force, not entirely by legal issues, but that was certainly part of the discussion. So yes, I think is the answer. Thank you. Um, question for Jan now. Where do international courts and tribunals fit in this landscape that, that your colleagues have just described? Um, do they level the playing field? Do they, do they give less powerful states um, opportunities for, for leverage or at least resistance? Thank you and good morning to you all. <clears throat> all of us in this room, uh, to the extent that we address 
the topic this morning could be said to be testing the veracity of a very, very old saying. Um, the law is like a spider's web. It catches the small insects, but the larger ones break through. Um, is that really correct? That has saying has been attributed to a number of people. I've, I've tried to look it up. Solon, it said, Aristotle, Somebody said Schopenhauer made it up and attributed it to those, so we'll never know, but uh, many people have said that. Uh, and, and, and is it really true? And I suggest it's, it's not necessarily so. Um, small states can, in some instances, be much more powerful than, can be very powerful, and can be more powerful than some large states in the way they use their influence. Um, large states sometimes throw their weight around, can't help themselves. I've got the weight, I'll use it. And it doesn't make them very popular and doesn't make them followed. Um, those states that um, are influential tend to do so with talent and human resources. Uh, human resources requires investment and education, and so it's not surprising that some of those small states uh, are relatively wealthy ones. Let's consider the other ones, other small states, poor small states. Uh, Michael has invited us to uh, reflect on our own personal experiences, which is very egocentric, but you have given us that license. Mm -hmm. uh, so let me tell you, I come from parents from a small country, Sweden, who brought me up in another small country called Liberia. Uh, and perhaps because uh, I grew up in West Africa, uh, for the first 20 years of my career, I tended to represent African states in their international disputes. Um, I'll name them so you'll believe that I know what I'm talking about. Uh, Subtropical Africa. I represented Guinea, that's the one with the capital of Conakry, uh, Liberia, Ivory Coast, Ghana, skip Benin and Togo, skip Nigeria, Cameroon, Chad to the north, all the way around, South Africa. Cameroon, I did four very large arbitrations in Kenya, I think 17 or 18 during the course of 20 years. So these are states, most of whom became independent in 1960. So I was working for them not so long thereafter. And one thing I will say in answer to the question, leveling, leveling the playing field, uh, provided that some, uh, at some point, some experience is given to um, the actors in these states, they see that international courts and tribunals and international law itself can very much level the playing field uh, in ways that uh, surprise perhaps the other side who are tempted to take advantage of institutional weakness and, and, and immaturity. So what uh, one is able to see, I'll give you just a couple of examples of, of what can be achieved. If you do the hard work of trying to win the case and look at the facts, and, and, and show how that can be done, you can expose powerful actors from abroad who might create a certain complex. They, they seem to have been in every country. They seem to know what they're doing. They're very powerful, multinational, and so forth. But perhaps the actors they had in your environment cut corners, um, were tempted to do so, and did so. So have a look at it. Uh, and in, in, in a number of instances, you're able to see that you're able to, to demonstrate that there is chicanery. Uh, I recall in Kenya, uh, a major industrial dispute where at the end an international tribunal held that at the time the largest industrial co corporation of a, of, of a prominent European country had engaged, a, it's a German speaking country, had engaged in list, L-I-S-T. Now if you accuse somebody in German of deceit uh, and invalidate a contractual debt in that regard, that's quite a big Victory. It came as a surprise to the, to the Kenyans to some extent because they hadn't thought of it. So that's a different way of thinking of it uh, than saying, well, what we have to do in these circumstances, a defeatist point of view, is let's force them into local courts. Uh, if our lo local courts are not mature, perhaps they will not be, what happens there will not be respected and the foreigners will not respect it and, 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 and uh, we still have a problem. Or better yet, at the international level, let's defeat jurisdiction. Wow, we won. It's a pet peeve of mine. Uh, people who represent, uh, 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 some, sometimes people in my position who represent um, some of the weaker states and they, they defeat a claim 
um, by defeating jurisdiction. Well, you haven't solved the problem. You have an uh, irritated counterpart whose case hasn't been heard. Why is that a victory? Um, sometimes you're well off to say, well, we have a jurisdictional objection, but let's forget about it. Let's just see who is right in this case and determine whether you are right. And in those, those circumstances, uh, when that is done, uh, you have chosen the good option. And that creates, that inspires a great deal of confidence. That also assists sometimes in accepting tolerable losses, which is something people sometimes lose sight of. And I've seen a lot of my interlocutors, a lot of my uh, African civil servants, uh, having been engaged in international arbitration, said, well, you know, we didn't get all we asked for. Uh, we had to pay something, but it was lower than we might have settled. And we just feel now that we're talking as equals, and this is a good thing to do. So yes, definitely uh, the legal institutions that exist uh, uh, can level the playing field. They can only do so if they are perceived as legitimate. And that's another very large question, and it's a constant battle that we have to see to, the, see to it, uh, that there's never a sense that you're going into some place which doesn't have those uh, hallmarks of what makes something legitimate. But that's a larger subject, and I'll stop there. Well, thank you uh, very much. Uh, I'd like to come back to, to Victoria and ask about the, the experience of New Zealand in terms of international dispute settlement. Uh, uh, fairly small country. Um, have you been able to use courts and tribunals to, to level the playing field with more powerful actors? Thanks. Um, yes, in fact, um, we have. Uh, in preparing for this panel, I had a look at this. New Zealand has gone to state to state dispute settlement 14 times. Uh, and the record we have is of those 14 cases, uh, I would say nine were successful, three were settled uh, before a binding dispute settlement process was needed, and two were losses. Um, so that's a pretty good record, really. Uh, amongst those 14 cases, we have three ICJ cases, uh, which includes the two phases of the nuclear test case against France uh, and the whaling case, where Australia was the principal party, but New Zealand was a very engaged and involved intervener. Uh, we have the two separate parts of the Rainbow Warrior case, which I'll say a little bit about in a minute, the Southern Bluefin Tuna case against Japan, and eight WTO trade cases. Um, and the names of those will give you an idea of um, our uh, economy or might sound a bit like a dinner. Those cases are the Hungary agricultural subsidies, EC butter, India quotas, Canada dairy subsidies, US lamb, US steel, I guess that's the knife and fork in the dinner, Australia apples and Indonesia beef. Um, I think the Rainbow Warrior cases are a particularly good case study of a small state um, achieving some rebalancing of the playing field uh, via dispute settlement, um, and that involved France. So for those that are not familiar with the situation, the dispute arose when French government agents blew up a Greenpeace vessel, the Rainbow Warrior, that was moored in Auckland Harbour and killed a Dutch national who sadly was on board at the time. Uh, the New Zealand authorities apprehended the two agents, prosecuted them under New Zealand criminal law, and then sentenced them to a term of imprisonment. Uh, the international parts of the case, there were two different parts. First, there was an agreement to submit the matter to the UN Secretary General for a binding ruling in 1986. And then in 1990, when New Zealand considered that France hadn't abided by the terms of the UN Secretary General's decision, there was an arbitration. Now, both of those cases, um, I think, while they not have, may not have pleased the New Zealand public 100%, I think the view of the New Zealand government would be both decisions upheld international law and provided a satisfactory result. Uh, the first decision by the UN Secretary General was that the French Prime Minister should convey a formal and unqualified apology to the Prime Minister of New Zealand and should pay um, seven million in compensation and stop opposing New Zealand's butter exports. There's the um, trade angle again. In return for which New Zealand would transfer the French agents, because clearly France was very concerned um, to get its agents back, to 
Hull at all, where they were meant to stay uh, for a period of three years. And on New Zealand's insistence, the agreement with France about this included compulsory and binding adjudication of any future dispute. Now that turned out to be a good thing because when the two French agents were in fact returned to France before the end of the three year period, New Zealand had recourse to that binding dispute settlement. And the arbitral tribunal found indeed that France had breached the terms of the agreement by allowing the agents to um, return to France. Um, and recommended that in order to promote close and friendly relations between the two countries, that a fund be set up called the New Zealand-France um, Friendship Fund. And later in my career, when I um, was based in Paris, I was involved in the administration of that fund, and we were able to um, fund um, collaborative projects between schools and, and other institutions. Um, so I think that's a case where, indeed, um, we did get a result by having recourse to international law. Um, and it was positive um, in the long run for both parties because we have a very warm uh, and close relationship um, with France to this day. But I think there is also another kind of dark side um, if you think not, not so much about that, that case but about um, international dispute settlement more generally. And it comes down to the question of consent. So while... Um, for example, in the first nuclear test case, uh, also against France, um, we uh, had a result of, of a sort in that provisional measures were ordered uh, that France should stop uh, nuclear testing in the atmosphere. When we wanted to return to the court 20 years later, uh, when underground testing was taking place, uh, there was no jurisdiction because France had amended or oh, sorry, France had withdrawn its consent to the um, compulsory jurisdiction of the court. Um, likewise, the International Court of Justice case on whaling had a good result, um, not for the whales, unfortunately, but a good result at international law. But following that, uh, Japan adjusted its acceptance of the compulsory jurisdiction of the court so that there would be no further cases. Um, so I'd say we've had some good results. We still remain committed to uh, binding dispute settlement wherever possible, uh, but it's a very partial um, sort of patchwork uh, approach. Thanks. Uh, thank you. I, I'd like to go back to Jan with a follow-up question. Um, when you're advising a, a relatively less powerful state um, with regards to potential litigation or arbitration, um, are there certain conditions that you, you look for in the situation that, that may be more amenable to, to going uh, to the law, um, political, economic circumstances? So, so for instance, if, if your, your client, the small state, um, is complaining about the behavior of a powerful state that is common in that powerful state's um, international practice, so, so there are multiple countries that are, 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 are subject to this behavior and, and your client is potentially a test case of relevance to a larger community. Does that make uh, resorting to, to litigation or arbitration more attractive as opposed to, to being in a circumstance that's, that's very much uh, on its own? Um, what kind of factors, not, not legal factors, but, but political economic factors um, might make the recourse to, to ar arbitration, to, to adjudication more attractive? You've you've turned your hypothetical your your, your follow-up question into a hypothetical. I've never been in the business of um, uh, of building up test cases as mm -hmm. as as you suggest. Uh, it's it's but generally speaking, at the outset of a potential dispute which might go unresolved, uh, just get lost sort of attitude, or uh, there might be a desire to deal with it. Um, the first question you ask any client anywhere is, uh, what are your true objectives? You try to eliminate, um, you, or you try to identify uh, dangers of pure domestic politics, uh, the more harrowing dangers of, of corruption. Uh, you try to speak to people who are not interested in, in pure politics and, and, and those who uh, those who will 
not uh, operate for private game and then see what, you know, what, what is it that you really, what really wish to achieve. Sometimes um, in dealing with other states and very often dealing with international economic partners, uh, you can come out of a dispute which you lost and in which you behaved in an honorable way and just accepting the defeat as a winner because reputationally it just gives the others who are observing this and perhaps the very party that defeated you a feeling of confidence and great great desire to continue relations with you um, that stands in stark contrast uh, may i say victoria having been in france at the time you discussed uh, that was the time of a socialist government mitterrand and his idealism in particular, his defense minister who gave the orders for those agents to go to New Zealand and their manipulations in trying to avoid the terms of the of the detention and how were quite shocking and didn't go over very well in France and actually earned them a reputation for cynicism, which has never gone away. Political scientists are particularly interested in the role of reputation with regards to uh, not just international politics, but also international law. So, so thank you for, for that point. Um, I want to turn to Danielle now um, and, and shift from international courts and tribunals to, to international treaties and treaty regimes. Um, do treaties play a similar role in terms of constraining or channeling power um you've mentioned but you might want to elaborate on on whether treaty regimes are are particularly amenable to to, to certain kinds of issues where, where 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 power has less traction than other issues where, where do where do treaties fit into this this law versus power dynamic that we're talking about today thanks for the question it's um not amenable to a simple answer i think Treaties are kind of the, I would call the external manifestation, if I could put it, um, of certain standards and rules that country, the international community is prepared to live by and abide by. In the area of trade, I think it's one where you see this tension between what I call a, a real mixed bag of interest. Because in any country, um, and not just Singapore, any country, there are areas of trade in which there are very offensive interests. But increasingly, I think today, um, we see the intersection between trade, international trade policy and domestic policy in a very, uh, in a clear light that perhaps may not have been so obvious before. And let me explain a little bit about that. I mean, the trade, area, well, Singapore, for example, we have a number of trade agreements entered some as 10, over 10, 15, 20 years ago in a different environment. Um, in today's environment, um, we have seen how uh, certain players and actors have used the trade regime um, and it has an, sort of an annex, an inadvertent or perhaps unanticipated effect on domestic policies. And the policy space that we see, for example, in between trade and health, and then tobacco being a case in point. So how do, how do then treaties come into play? Um, so I think treaties allow us to set the rules, but I think increasingly we have to remember to also revisit treaties and review treaties uh, as part of a, they are not static, uh, they need to be made fit for purpose. And so that's a little bit of a reflection of the changing and dynamic nature of global politics. Uh, things can shift very quickly. And so while treaties are important in providing predictability uh, as well as a common set of level playing field rules for everyone, there always needs to be, and I think from, from, a, from, a inter, from a legal advisor to the government, and this is something I'm constantly speaking to our policy uh, uh, colleagues about, is that don't think about um, the immediate issues of the day or the immediate interests of the day. Uh, are you able to create within the treaties a living mechanism, a dynamic mechanism, which will allow you and your counterparts to come back, revisit the treaty, to allow it to fit the purposes of tomorrow? 
So you ask, which area is it more unnameable? Um, and which area, and I could perhaps answer this in this way, in which way is treaties, are treaties less amenable? And I mentioned it a little bit earlier, in, in new emergent areas. Uh, and the case in point being cyber norms. Uh, and the UN uh, group of government experts have been trying, and, and they put together in 2015 a list of uh, recommended norms for governing state-to-state -state relations in the use of cyber, cyber warfare, cyber operations, cyber oper whatever you want to call it. But that's really the, the flavor of the day. And it, there was great achievement um, in the committee, uh, in the, uh, the group of government experts, in, I think in 2013, even coming to a point where they said international law applies to cyberspace. Even coming to that point was difficult. Then the next point is, but well, then what are the cyber rules that govern the cyberspace? Do the traditional rules apply? And so the committee came up with, uh, the group of experts came up with about 15 uh, a set of norms. But they are non-binding norms. And I think that's probably sensible because the landscape, it's, it's very fast. Uh, the technology is moving very quickly and often ahead of what the government is aware of. Uh, even advanced uh, governments are sometimes behind the curve or trying to catch up to you know, what's happening in the dark web. You know? uh, so this is an area where I think treaties may not be amenable, where it may be better to come to a better understanding first, uh, confidence building measures, leveling up what I call capacity, because there's very different levels of understanding and knowledge and capacity. Uh, and if we set the rules too early, um, we may create a monster that doesn't work. And others are not, there will always be suspicion as well between are those who are more uh, advanced setting the rules for those who have yet to catch up. And, and that, I think, would be a recipe for disaster. Yeah. Thank you uh, for that. One thing I, I've noticed uh, in my own research um, lately is is the adoption of, of soft law instruments um, such as guidelines which are then incorporated into domestic legal systems as hard law. So what we look at as soft law might actually be hard in terms of its actual application to non-state actors. And, and this, this, this dynamic, again, constantly moving, very fast-paced. Um, and thank you for, for bringing that, that issue of soft law onto the table. Um, back, back to Victoria, the, the same question about, about treaty regimes, um, I guess about international law outside of, of the court and tribunal um, area. Um, do these regimes constrain the, the powerful or, or do they actually constrain the less powerful uh, with the powerful setting the terms of the treaties uh, that then apply to everyone? Thanks very much, Michael. Um, well, I think there's a question here whether we are necessarily committed going forward to always having big, complex treaty regimes. And um, Danielle's just touched, on, as have you, uh, on the idea that perhaps we will need different instruments going forward to address the problems uh, that need to be solved by collaborative solutions. And, and I think that's, that's probably right. But we do have some really significant multilateral tra treaty regimes, um, and I wanted to touch on two of those. Uh, and it's no surprise that both fall within the areas identified um, by Daniel Bethlehem in his article. So the two I wanted to touch on are the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and the WTO agreements. Um, and I think the UNCLOS, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, is a great example of a treaty regime that was needed to address issues that could not be addressed by any um, individual states, no matter how powerful they might be. Um, and I think it addressed the, all the package of issues that were brought into that negotiation in a way that was um, really positive for small states. And I'm thinking here of the exclusive economic zones and the regime of islands and what that meant for coastal states, but particularly for small island developing states. 
um, the economic resources that have come to small island developing states through exclusive economic zones is of massive importance. Um, I also think the Law of the Sea Convention is continuing uh, as quite a living thing to have an impact on a regular basis, um, particularly through regional fisheries management organisations. I myself attended the annual meeting of the South Pacific Regional Fisheries Management Organization in The Hague earlier this year. That's a 15 member organization covering a huge part of the South Pacific Ocean and has members at the large end, such as China and the US and the EU. And then at the other end of the spectrum, really small countries like Vanuatu, Cook Islands and Faroe Islands. And I mean, no organization is perfect, but to sit in those meetings and to hear the states uh, debating and contesting allocation decisions and arguing which countries' vessels need to be put on a blacklist of IUU vessels, that is to actually observe international law in action and working and um, constraining power and in, in an area where there is no other solution because we are talking about a high seas resource that requires management. Um, now, Danielle mentioned that we have to be open to keeping these regimes kind of alive and relevant and um, contemporary. And I think that is true. One issue that we are concerned about is that we don't want to see sea level rise impact on the exclusive economic zones of those small island developing states I mentioned. So we are looking at how it could be possible in a way that respects the role of UNCLOS as a constitution for the oceans to ensure that those hard-won um, gains for small island developing states are not eroded by a phenomena that no one understood at the time of the negotiation of UNCLOS. So I think that's an example where we have to be brave enough to work on these regimes. Um, now, the other one I wanted to touch on briefly before Michael tells me to stop is the WTO agreements. Um, that is an area that has made a huge difference for a country like New Zealand. We've had eight WTO disputes um, in the post-Uruguay era, and we have won them all. Um, but I don't think it's just a country like New Zealand that benefits. I believe the United States has won 90% of the cases it has pursued um, under the WTO dispute settlement system. Um, but it is, unlike UNCLOS, which I think is still in reasonably good shape and is still working, and I've observed that myself, we are at a bit of a crisis in the WTO um, because it turned out that although it was one of the best and most robust dispute settlement systems, it had an Achilles heel, which is that it is possible for one country to block appointment of appellate body members, and that's what we're observing. Um, so this is a real priority for New Zealand to work with other countries to try and address that, that issue and keep the WTO dispute settlement system alive. Uh, we're working in a Canada-led group of um, countries on WTO reform. We've co-sponsored an EU-led uh, paper so trying to find some constructive solutions to the concerns uh, that the US is expressing. And our permanent representative in Geneva to the WTO is a facilitator of a group that's trying to progress discussions in Geneva. Um, so uh, that's an area where I think we have to all come together to protect what is a really important public good, the WTO system, and it does involve having a look at the concerns. Is the system perfect? No. We liked it a lot, uh, but in order to save the system, uh, we need to be open to rebalancing and adjusting, the way Danielle has said. Um, and then looking ahead, you know, I don't think any of us envisage that it's going to be easy to conclude new complicated treaty regimes. Um, perhaps the last uh, of those is being negotiated in New York as we speak. Uh, the um, implementing agreement on biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, we're pretty optimistic about that because we think there is a clear framework for that to be developed in uh, and a clear need. But um, things such as um, cyber, uh, I think we come up against the issue that we need to constrain the actions of non-state actors. 
uh, we've become very aware in very tragic circumstances of the role that social media platforms can play in um, getting the message of violent extremism out and promoting that message. Uh, will it a big treaty regime to control um, Facebook and Google be the solution? Probably not, but we are determined to work with other partners to try and come up with solutions to these issues. And it may involve looking at international law and how international law deals with non-state actors uh, in new and innovative ways. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask one more question before I turn to the audience. So uh, start thinking of your uh, your questions or your your insights, and, and as you think of them, frame them in the most concise of ways so we can get uh, maximum uh, interaction. Now, now, Brian, I haven't forgotten about you down at the end of the table. Uh, I, I, I want to come back to a, to a comment that, that you made earlier um, where, where you suggested that when a, a powerful country uh, withdraws from a, an international agreement like the Iran nuclear deal, that that is almost uh, the, 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 the tribute to legality um, being paid. Um, I mean, if it doesn't matter, why not just stay in? Uh, and, and we've seen uh, the United States withdraw from, from number, a number of these international treaties from the, uh, and agreements of different kinds, non-treaties, the, the, um, the Paris uh, Climate Change Agreement, the INF uh, Treaty would be two other examples. We've also seen the United States not join a treaty regime and then actively campaign against it. I'm thinking of the International Criminal Court. Um, is it actually true that this strengthens the regime, this, this withdrawal or opposition, uh, or um, does a, a particularly powerful state um, in, in not joining and even opposing actually undermine and, and weaken the international institution? Or, or is it just a, 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 an ad hoc evaluation that we need to make? Is there, is there a general answer here or, or does it depend on the particular circumstances? No, I, I think that if I said that the regime was strengthened by the U.S. withdrawing from the JCPOA, I, I want to amend my statement. I don't think that that's true at all. Um, I think my point was more the first one you made, Michael, which mm -hmm. is uh, that it shows that a powerful country like the United States does think a lot about its obligations and its commitments in these in these instruments, but I absolutely believe that uh, the international order is better off with powerful states being part of these agreements. Um, so no, it doesn't strengthen the regime to have uh, states withdraw. Um, but I think it it's important for uh, for states to take their obligations seriously. If you're going to sign up to an agreement, and this is. My experience in the United States, you know, even thinking back to when we were thinking about joining the Disabilities Convention a few years ago, um, we U.S. to the befuddlement of many has never joined this treaty, even though it's based largely on U.S. law, and uh, we spent many, many uh, hours debating internally in the U.S. government with states, with members of Congress about this treaty, and the questions were always along the lines of. Why should a non-government expert from country X get to judge what's going on in my juvenile detention facility in Kansas? Um, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a fair question. It's one I think you need to wrestle with when you're thinking about joining a treaty. Uh, but I think it, it leads me to the conclusion that, uh, that Danielle was just suggesting, which is it's gonna be very difficult, uh, Victoria as well, to find multilateral conventions that the powerful states will join. And I think that's because states recognize the importance of the commitments that they make in these treaties. Um, it would be entirely cynical for states to join without any intention of complying. Uh, and I think that's where the, the balance lies. I'm reminded of a, a conversation I had with uh, John Bolton um, back when Bill Clinton was still president. Um, and I was uh, um, being one of these uh, morally uprighteous Canadians and <laughs> criticizing the United States for, for ratifying relatively few international treaties. And his response um, has stayed in, in my memory ever since. When we ratify treaties, we do so with the intent of 
adhering to them. Um, implicitly criticizing my country for being a little bit more casual about implementation. Uh, so so it's, it's, it's a valid point. Um, Let me just say that we're very glad to have Canada criticize us. Uh, you're very polite in doing so, but it's, it's also very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> and just to continue that conversation, I, I would also suggest that, that when the United States um, has a, a, a moment in its history when, it, when it's particularly um, uh, unengaged, disengaged from, from the international legal system uh, like it is today, that this does challenge other countries to, to pull together and to keep the system going. Um, and I hope that's what we're seeing today, that, that countries like Canada that, that, that used to quite happily follow in the slipstream of, of benevolent U.S. power are now having to, to step up and, and show some leadership themselves. Um, th this conversation could go on forever up here, but that's not the point. Uh, we have more than half an hour for a discussion involving the audience. There is a microphone. Um, who wants to be first? This is an amazing opportunity. These people know so much. I'm looking. Um, okay, I'm going to call on someone. Um, <laughs> no, no, before you step up, before you step up, I've already going to decide I'm going to call on the gentleman behind you. Alan, do you want to contribute to this conversation? I'm looking at the Canadian legal advisor here. <laughs> okay, yes, ma'am. Thank you. So, uh, I'm Jimmy Nguyen with Voice of Vietnamese Americans. Thank you. I would like to ask about the UNCLOS and WTO and um, the enforcement of the agreement. You know what happened to the UNCLOS in the South China Sea. What would you suggest um, the international society take actions to rein in the violations in that area? It's a wonderful question. It, it does go to um, the issue of powerful states and, and international law because we do have a tribunal decision on the South China Sea that, that is not being fo followed by, by a very powerful state. Um, does anyone want to speak to, to that issue? It, it's obviously topical and contentious and, and therefore perfect uh, for this, uh, this panel. Yeah. I have an observation, not, not, not any kind of an answer. Um, let, let us assume, so this is the example of not of the little insect that gets caught in the spider's web. These are the ones who are not bothered by spider's web if they feel like not being bothered by them. Um, so examples might be, but let us assume we have no, as lawyers, we have no position as to the Chinese entitlement in, in the maritime zones. Let us assume that we have no position whatsoever with respect to Russia's entitlement to the Crimea. We just don't know. And we're looking at these claims being made and what is the reaction of these two powerful states. Uh, in the instance, it's a problem for each of them. China has to decide, do we default? Mm, the risk of defaulting is an adverse decision. That adverse decision may be the fruit of a very substantial process, which has given a lot of attention can never be annulled and will be a datum for the next century and more. That's what will happen if we default as a possible risk. Instead, what we might then do is set up um, a data center, uh, a website that continually sends out uh, information uh, supporting the Chinese position, unilaterally, exclusively, 100% that many of us in this room receive on a regular basis, perhaps with very good arguments. I'm saying I have, we have no views as to the ultimate entitlements. It shows a certain attitude. With regard to the Crimea, what does it mean when President Putin actually writes a lengthy legal brief, extremely well written, going back to the history, and if you read only that you and, and nothing else, you might be rather convinced. It shows, um, I think, uh, the point that Brian was, was, was making a few moments ago, that this is something to be taken into account and is taken very seriously. And that in, in and of itself is a powerful observation. So the international legal discourse continues even when, formally speaking, a, a country is choosing not to comply. Yes. Uh, Victoria, you wanted to comment on this. 
Um, thank you, and I'd like to thank the uh, questioner. Um, yes, I chose to focus in my comments on UNCLOS on some of the areas that I think are um, going well. Uh, you are right, there are some concerning developments in the South China Sea. Uh, now, New Zealand doesn't take a position on the various claims in the South China Sea, but we do, uh, like the rest of the international community, have an interest in how the tensions are managed and in ensuring the maintenance of international law, including the freedom of navigation and overflight. Um, and that is why we encourage all claimants to refrain from actions which will escalate tensions and will run counter to the confidence that is necessary to arrive at an enduring solution. Um, and we, uh, yeah, we encourage the parties to resolve the dispute um, in a peaceful manner through diplomacy and dialogue and in accordance with international law, particularly UNCLOS. I'd like to move on to the next question, if that's okay, Danielle, Brian. Okay, yes, please. Hello, good morning. My name is Freya Bartens from the University of Oslo in Leiden. And of course, I agree with Danielle that um, all states are sovereign and equal, but I don't think that will suffice to take you off the menu, so to speak. So I would like to suggest um, that the most obvious solution for um, small states is to join together in, in strong regional, often regional organizations. And to give you just one illustration from my, my corner of the world in, in Europe for uh, centuries, the interests of Ireland as a small state were not taken particularly uh, serious in, uh, by Great Britain. Whereas if we now look at the Brexit negotiations with the weight of the EU behind it, suddenly <coughs> Irish interests become quite a, a pivotal point in finding any kind of solution uh, for a future agreement between the, the UK and the EU. So I would like to ask in the first place, Danielle, but also the other panel members, whether, first of all, you agree that forming strong regional unions is the way forward for, for small states. And secondly, whether you think we will or we should see similar developments um, in Asia and other parts of the world. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Danielle. Thank you for the question. Thanks very much. And I, I think I would, on, a, on, a, on, a, on one level, I would certainly agree with you. I think we have to look at the toolbox available. Uh, and one of the toolbox is actually uh, the like-minded or the regional. And they're not necessarily mutually exclusive because you will find countries similar interests scattered across different regions from different political makeups. And you just happen to be issue specific. And I think that's one thing that we can work together um, it's an old Chinese idiom, you know, a singular straw, you break very easily, you buy them together, it's very, becomes very strong. And I certainly share that philosophy. And certainly in the region, um, and Singapore is, is with, it, it is Asian ASEAN, the ASEAN Southeast Asian uh, organization. Um, I don't know whether I have any other ASEAN colleagues here, but, the, but it has gone through a process, a long history, um, and, and going from a more loose collective um, uh, in terms of cooperation to a more rules-based organization. And we've seen that evolution in ASEAN, particularly in the last five to 10 years. And you have a whole body of a new, entire new area of practice of law called ASEAN law, which never used to exist before. So I think in that sense, um, ASEAN countries do recognize the value uh, in, in shape coming together. Having said that, we must remember also ASEAN is, is not a homogenous region. Uh, perhaps Europe, in Europe, for example, the EU, there's a, a big, big, perhaps bigger shared history, a bigger shared legal tradition. That's not the case in ASEAN. So we have to find our own way to work together. And I think we have done that, particularly in the economic fields. There's a lot of uh, ASEAN economic agreements uh, with legal binding uh, effect. ASEAN as a group has negotiated a number of ASEAN plus agreements. New Zealand, Australia, for example, and currently negotiating this mega, mega, mega regional called RCEP, uh, where we again try and come together and we speak with a common voice in the negotiations with uh, the ASEAN plus partners. So I certainly agree with you that that's one way. Whether or not you'll go the way of the uh, uh, a supranational organization that we see elsewhere, um, that's always a question that's being asked. And I think ASEAN will have to find its own way. But I may take this opportunity to, to come to, to your point and also the question that was raised by the earlier speaker uh, and, and in the contribution to the South China Seas because ASEAN is right now working with China and negotiating a code of conduct for the South China Sea. 
So like New Zealand, we don't have any uh, substantive you know, uh, position or stake or interest in the dispute itself. But I think it's one way where ASEAN can come together and work to, to contribute to a peace, uh, to maintenance of peace and security in our region. Um, if I could just say a little bit in response to that question, um, Coalition Building 101 is the most essential tool for uh, any New Zealand diplomat. Um, you asked about regional organisations. Uh, uh, one uh, challenge for us is if you look at our part of the world, there's an awful lot of uh, ocean and not a lot of countries. <laughs> so we are really agnostic as to geography in our coalition building. Uh, we certainly see ourselves as part of the Asia-Pacific region and um, work on creating uh, international legal regimes with that group. But equally, uh, we have worked on um, with other coalitions in the anti-nuclear context. Uh, we have a lot of collaboration with the small island developing states. Uh, there's even a group called the Mountains Group that we work with in the UN, which is a group of um, uh, democracies who all happen to have a lot of mountains in their country. Uh, so yeah, we will work with um, any other countries on the basis of shared interests and shared values um, to uh, pursue things that we care about. Thank you. Um, next question, please. Hi, Jason File from The Hague. Um, I was interested if the panelists could comment a bit on um, the possibility that dispute resolution mechanisms could also be uh, some form of glo global commons as well. Um, and the South China Sea example I think is a is a good one um, in the sense that it, it's one of many ways that different treaties uh, filter into just a few um, shared dispute resolution mechanisms such as the ICJ or the PCA um, and every time that there is a decision that is um, flouted in some way by the losing party uh, it affects a kind of a, an impoverishment of the mechanism itself. Uh, it can be embarrassing to the court. And I think that there could be a risk that parties, that, that interested parties, um, may focus on the issue-specific questions, such as what position might we take, if any, on uh, the South China Sea specifically. And that could be to the detriment of uh, to what extent we wish to see compliance in general with decisions from these institutions. Um, it's sort of this trade-off between short-term and longer-term uh, health of the, the mechanism itself. So I'm wondering if the, the panelists could comment on, on uh, to what extent we should take into account the, the health of the dispute resolution mechanism itself. And before I turn to the panel, can I just point out that this is not a question just about China. One could go back to the Nicaragua case and see similar behavior by the United States. So, so when a, a powerful actor disregards a ruling from a, a, a significant international court or, or, or tribunal, does that weaken the institution in a way that, that is to the detriment of all other countries? Um, Brian, want to have a crack at this one? Sure. Uh, so I, I, I think that there's a. Uh, it's a good question, and I think there's a tendency sometimes uh, for the parties who are happy with respect to any decision, not just the South China Sea, to uh, to want to make it bigger than it is, and parties who are unhappy to want to put it in a box and forget about it forevermore. Um, and I, I mean, I, I remember with the South China Sea example in particular, you know, you've got on the one hand, under the UNCLOS, you have very clear rules that these uh, uh, arbitrations are just in the facts of the case. There's no binding precedential aspect to the decisions. Um, and talking to people in the, in our own, in the US government about these aspects that, uh, were important limitations to the parties the treaty, which of which the U.S. is not, of course. Um, uh, so I do think that there's something to be said for respecting the rules of the road uh, for dispute resolution, but also recognizing what those rules actually are in doing so, and not aggrandizing the rules beyond what the state parties to the particular convention may have agreed to when they when they joined the 
uh, the convention. I think that would actually help um, strengthen the legitimacy of the institutions. Um, but based on my own experience, there is this tendency to want to uh, exaggerate the impact when you're happy about it as a political or foreign policy matter, which I think is uh, as dangerous as not complying when you're unhappy with the decision. And now for, for, for a small state perspective on the question, Victoria. Um, thank you. I would just comment that I think states do, from my own experience, think fairly carefully before they take a dispute. Um, I indicated that we have had 14 disputes uh, over the um, history of New Zealand. Um, so I don't think it's something that states do lightly. And the issues you raise as to what the impact could be of a decision that is not respected are taken into account. Um, I wanted to also mention that often dispute settlement mechanisms have obligations to negotiate and consult before you get to the binding process. And they can be really valuable. And I think I even saw that there is a panel that is focusing actually on that subject matter. Um, of the 14 disputes we have taken, in three of those cases, and they were all trade cases, uh, were resolved satisfactorily before the panel stage. Okay, I'm going to go back to the audience. Alan. Thank you, Michael. Alan Kessel, I'm the um, legal advisor for the Canadian Foreign Ministry and sort of forgot about the Aristotelian method for a long time since I've been in law school. But thank you, Michael, uh, because um, you did poke this dozing dog, and I figure. I should um, should help you make your day. Um, <laughs> the uh, the fact is that I very rarely thought of Canada sort of following in the slipstream of our American <laughs> friends. Although we are we are your um, closest friends, not always your best friends. Um, we uh, have benefited from so many of the things that we work together. Brian has always been a, a treat when you were in government and outside. Um, Clearly, we as a middle power benefit very strongly from the, uh, the balances that we've created since the Second World War in, uh, in, the, in, in the power balance. Uh, we've created institutions that we're very fond of. We worry when we see them undermined. WTO is the most important one to us, and I think I joined Victoria in what she's saying. Uh, we, do, um, we do worry when we see large powers um, flagrantly violate their international obligations. We're living through a particularly difficult process right now with one of our own foreign service officers being detained arbitrarily in China by the Chinese government in violation of Article 39 of the Vienna Convention. We have asked them to live up to their international obligations. We think it's in the interest of China to do so, and we think it's in the interest of other countries to join us in asking China to do so. So I'm asking you to do so. Thank you. <laughs> Does anyone want to respond to that, or should we treat it as a highly informed comment? <laughs> highly informed comment. Thank you, Alan. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Henry Bensuto from the Philippines, and uh, thank you for all the panel speakers. I do apologize for taking the podium, but I was struck by the statement of Brian. Okay. And, uh, I think. There's a saying in philosophy, he who generalizes generally lies. And most of the time, if you don't give specifics, it leads to confusion more than clarification. I would like to take note of your statement that normally when for those who win, exaggerating is a dangerous point. I agree with the, with the principle, but I think as you mentioned that in relation to the South China Sea, I, I have to correct the impression in terms of the Philippines, for example, uh, gloating on this. On the contrary, we did not. Uh, and so I think it is a question of mindset at the end mm -hmm. of the day, that one of the reasons why perhaps in yesterday's discussion about the disenchantment is when a decision is made, what should the international community who, who are at the end of the day stakeholders should do? And this is how we, we we actually move on and move forward. When you look at the specifics of the South China Sea, the implications do not only concern the direct parties to this. I suggest that people who may have general notions of the decision go back to the decision, look at the map, and look at the implications on how this eventually impact, not just on the two countries, the literal countries, the region, the global, the user, 
uh, states and on principle, how do we view international law as the tie that binds us all together in a community of nations? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone like to respond, Brian? Yeah, just, just very briefly, I, um, that's a, a very valid comment and, and I didn't mean to suggest that any particular country other than my own perhaps was uh, gloating over that decision. Uh, and uh, I, I think that in my view, the lesson or to go to the earlier comment, uh, this was a dispute resolution process that both countries agreed to. There was a dispute resolution. There's a decision. You got to comply with the decision. Uh, that's uh, and don't don't make it with with respect to the points of what the impact on the larger uh, map. I, I agree with that as well. But but focus on compliance with the decision first and foremost. Okay, next question, please. Hi, my name is Rubal Salem. I'm a researcher affiliated with the Oppenheimer Chair for Public International Law at uh, McGill uh, Faculty of Law. And I was actually interested in a comment one of you made about ensuring their legal regime remains relevant and effective. So I was hoping to hear a bit more about reform of the United Nations. You know, there was talk about the secu Security Council at some point, and I come originally from the Middle East where, you know, uh, the way people react to respect of international law, the one thing that always comes up is but the Security Council, there's a deadlock, whether it's on Israel, Palestine, Syria. And so I was wondering how do small states feel about this whole discussion on reforming the Security Council? Is it still relevant? Is it an element to consider when, when you know, thinking about how international law can be a counterweight to power? Thank you. Okay, does anyone want to respond? Yeah, okay. Daniel? Yeah. Thank you for the question, and I'm happy to take that question on. I think the questions of reform of the U UN will, will never really go away. I think every year is on the agenda um, and is, is being discussed every year. But I think the, the fact that it is being discussed is probably the more important uh, lesson I would take from this, because it, it, is, it, is a, it is an organization that is very important in peace and security since the Second World War. Um, but it was an organization that was built over 50 years ago. And so the debate is, a, the fact that we're having the debate is healthy. Uh, where it goes from here, I don't really know. But I, I, you know, certainly this debate about representation, uh, about enlargement of the Security Council, uh, and what is quite interesting, and, and I don't have any views or opinions on this, what is quite interesting is how small states have, particularly in the past uh, one, two years, uh, in, in the resurgence of the power and the balance uh, by, by the UN General Council. I think that is a very interesting development, where in the areas where the Security Council has uh, been criticized for not being acting, the, you see the UN General Assembly coming out with resolutions on their own, on, the, on that on that end. Um, so is that, a, is that an indicator of self-help <laughs> in a very colloquial way where small states uh, try and band together to put forward resolutions on important issues of the day? Um, so it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a development worth watching. Next question. Hi, I'm James Stewart from the University of British Columbia, also in Canada, but uh, I'm originally from New Zealand, and so I wondered if I could ask my compatriot a question. Uh, about the International Criminal Court, actually. Because it strikes me that the International Criminal Court might um, invite us to think in different ways about the relationship between small states and international law. In part because empirically it seems observable that small states are more likely to adhere to the International Criminal Court. Perhaps because they see uh, an ability to enlist international law in the service of their own self-defense to sort of bolster their military inferiority relative to superpowers which don't need to adhere to the ICC for that purpose. But I wonder how, on the other hand, that sits with the critical histories of international law that see international law as a pure instrument in the service of power with little emancipatory uh, potential of its own. So it seems like there's potentially a tension there that uh, might be interesting for our discussion. Okay, uh, Victoria? Thank you. Um, so you started with the idea that small states are more likely to ratify an instrument like the International Criminal Court. Um, 
because they see value in constraining big states. I mean, that may be, well be the case. I don't think it was what motivated New Zealand's ratification of the ICC. Uh, I think we ratified uh, because uh, we saw there was real value in providing a permanent institution to carry out this work. Uh, we had seen the valuable input from the tribunals that have been set up by the Security Council, but thought a more consistent and more permanent approach was appropriate. Um, I'm just trying to remember the other part of the question. Perhaps the moderator can help me. What else? <laughs> You're doing fine. Um, <laughs> uh, I... I guess I would also say that the International Criminal Court came about in a particular time and place uh, in the mid-1990s when I was starting my career as an international lawyer, and I see that as the sort of time when it was perhaps at um, international law was at its zenith, and there was a lot of um, possibility and a lot of optimism about uh, treaty law regimes. Uh, it seems it seems more difficult now. We're in a, a more challenging, complicated space, but we can only hope that um, through that uh, will come some kind of renewed approach. Uh, and I'd just suggest that uh, by uh, initiating an investigation of a, a, a powerful Western country, the, the International Criminal Court may be strengthening its reputation in a way that goes back to, to comments that, that Jan made earlier, that, that there, there's a new dynamic internationally, but the, uh, uh, the court is, uh, is certainly asserting itself as, as an actor. Um, okay, we, uh, we're getting close to the end, so I'm gonna take these two questions or comments uh, together, and then that will be it. So, yes, please. Hi, my name is Rosa Kang, and I'm the lawyer with uh, Canada's Foreign Ministry. Um, thank you for your insightful comments on how um, the international law can have an equalizing effect on uh, less powerful and more powerful states. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the role and the use of exceptions in international law. Um, I'm thinking particularly the national security exception in the context of the WTO. Uh, Victoria, you had mentioned that one of the key challenges at the WTO right now yeah. is the appellate body impasse. Um, I think another key challenge at the moment is how the national security exception will be interpreted in the WTO context. So I would welcome your views on the use and the role of um, uh, exceptions, particularly the national security exception in the context of international law and WTO. Thank you. So the government of Canada is asking for your legal advice. Um, <laughs> uh, last question. Good morning, Susan Carmani, and I'm at Hamad bin Khalifa University at Doha. Uh, yesterday we had a provocative uh, series of remarks here about the future of international law and challenges, and in particular, rising populism uh, around around the world, and questions regarding legitimacy of inter international law. Um, I think that Danielle's observation about uh, the need to re-examine treaties is important, but in the context of opening up uh, this box, we are going to go down a path. We're unleashing a lot of forces, uh, individuals and groups that feel like this system of elitism that uh, is perceived to, to be dictating from on high has no place uh, uh, for them. At least this is a lot of the message I picked up uh, yesterday. And I was just curious then, in, in light of this, in light of this uh, populism that is going on, uh, what will really be the significance of international law as, as a counterweight in the power, in, in the power struggle? Um, are we going to see more in the context of like soft law and the role of various actors to come in and, and shape law? Are we going to see this as, Michael, as you described it, as being more uh, adoption of national laws and letting that, that struggle take place in, in the domestic systems versus at the international realm. Okay. Uh, I'm going to give the, the first question to Victoria, the, the second question to Brian and Danielle, and then I have a final question for Jan, and then we're done. Okay? So, Victoria. Uh, 
I, I'm not sure I um, came to this panel prepared to expound on the national security exception and the WTO agreements. And it's interesting because I went to Ottawa before I came here and I seem to recall, and I think Alan Kessel can agree, I actually posed that question to the trade law <laughs> lawyers um, within the Canadian system. Um, okay. One thing I do recall is there is an, and I don't have it to hand, but there is an excellent quotation from the time the GATT was no, negotiated where somebody, and I think it might have been the US um, representative, made a comment that the future of the system would depend on the actors in the system behaving appropriately and responsibly. And that was somehow linked to the negotiation of that national security exception. Uh, and I think in a way it is a great shame that it has suddenly been put under the spotlight and is having to be tested in um, dispute settlement. And it could even be the silver lining in the fact that we may be about to experience a hiatus in the appellate body, that it will give some time and space for the main actors of the system, the states, to return to a more responsible and disciplined approach to applying the WTO obligations so we don't have to subject that particular exception to um, analysis and jurisprudence because it contains within it a lot of complicated, competing, challenging uh, issues that are all very important. Okay, uh, Brian, a few words on populism and international law. Yeah, um, my, so my wife sometimes accuses me of being too Pollyannish on everything. So with that caveat, I think that uh, the what people see as populism is, uh, is, is certainly there. I actually think it's good for international law. Uh, and I think that uh, we, if you look back on the history, at least since World War II or World War I of uh, skepticism towards international law, at least in the United States, you see kind of a cyclical approach where uh, there is an underlying skepticism probably with populist roots to uh, international law. Uh, but it, the skepticism, uh, sometimes because of tragedies, leads to modifications and, in my mind, improvements in international law. And I think that it opens a dialogue on things like some of the things that we've been talking about, uh, the use of norms, uh, maybe a reversion to uh, customary international law and reliance on uh, further development uh, in a way that we, uh, is an alternative to some of the multilateral treaties that we've grown to rely on over the last 70 years or so. Uh, so it's definitely a challenging period for international law, but I don't think it necessarily means it's we're looking at the the cliff for international law and it is undoubtedly a very interesting time for international law because things are changing danielle a few last words um sure certainly um when we respond to the question i think if i've given the impression that i think all treaties need to be re-examined uh, i think i should correct that because I think at the end of the day, the starting point of, of, my, of my conversation this morning is the predictability of the system. And that means the sanctity of agreements have got to be respected. Whatever we agreed on has to be respected. But it, what it also doesn't mean is that we keep our eyes closed. Uh, it does require a commitment and a willingness to dialogue. And I think that's first important. Uh, just because you don't like it doesn't mean you can walk away. You need to dialogue and together come to an agreement on areas which clearly need to be fit for purpose and repurposed. But I, I also draw some encouragement from how actors in the international system are using the parameters of what we have now to, to meet the needs of today. What do I mean by that? I mean, for example, we talked about the ICJ uh, and, we and we talked about other international dispute settlement bodies. Um, and and, and it, it reminded me of the Timor-Leste and Australian conciliation, a, a very successful one, the first of its kind, um, where a, the tribunal used a, a mechanism, mechanism that is rarely used, in fact, hardly ever used, and was able to resolve a very tricky and very difficult, politically difficult issue. 
Um, and I think that brings to mind how tribunals are also, in a way, reinventing uh, and adapting their practices. Um, you see more probably use of experts uh, in helping to resolve such matters. We, we ourselves saw this almost, almost 10 years ago um, in our um, it lost uh, land reclamation case where you know, the, the panel very, very wisely asked the parties to go together, appoint, jointly appoint a group of experts, technical experts, uh, because the issues that the court has to deal with are, can be very complex and can be very technical, which lawyers and judges by training uh, will require the help of third party scientific experts to, to resolve. And I think that is also an, an area which I, I find some encouragement that the courts are also in their own way. Um, I won't call it judicial activism as such, but I do think there's a certain innovativeness in the approach, which I think is quite important. Okay, and with your indulgence, one last quick question for Jan. Uh, I referred earlier in our discussion to the fact that we have um, two representatives here from small states who, who demonstrate that, that small states can have exceptionally strong foreign ministries. But that's not common again across all small states. Some small states are, are relatively, relatively poor um, or have gone through um, uh, transitions that uh, ha have compromised their, their governmental effectiveness. Um, is the ability to, 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 to run a, a, a highly effective professional foreign ministry with uh, squads of, of, of experienced uh, international lawyers a, a manifestation of power within the international legal system? And are we missing part of the picture by not talking about those dozens of states who simply can't do that? It's a fair comment, but I am struck by the fact that even in the smallest and poorest countries, there are individuals who are extremely alert to international law, very interested in it, and, and, and you meet the most talented people sitting in a very modest environment sometimes, uh, and, and somehow find a way to keep abreast of developments. And that's surely something which is very encouraging for international lawyers. I think about 100 years ago, could you talk to people anywhere about international law with any breath? I think all across our planet now, uh, even lay people have ideas about international law. They have expectations and they have great disappointments when it doesn't work out the way they think it is. And sure enough, they're ignorant about what international law means and, 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 and how it operates. And they have eccentric views of it. But then again, some of the great specialists of international law have eccentric views about how it operates. So that's not, uh, that's, that's not so strange. And that is a new world we're living in and that surely is encouraging and I associate myself with Brian and being Pollyann in that respect. Well, it's nice to end with a, a note of optimism from <laughs> the most experienced of our, our panelists. Uh, I, I think we've been treated to a, a phenomenal display of, uh, of professionalism and, and insight and, and I ask you to join me in thanking all of our panelists today.